Good evening. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to join all of you. And I'm delighted to have an opportunity to share. Um, personally, I wanted to share a little bit that um, I, was per I was born in Chicago, and I grew up in Pennsylvania. And um, this is near and dear to my heart, too, because I have two children. Uh, I proudly say that some of the best products that are MIF, made in Fremont, um, mine are uh, 22 and 18, and that's one of the things that um, really inspires me to come and talk to all of you today, and how important it is to encourage our youth to get involved. Um, so as I was saying earlier, I was born in Chicago and grew up in Pennsylvania, and at that time period where I grew up, it's outside of Philadelphia, and it's so different than what you see maybe in your cities. I don't know, because I, kn I know they're coming from all over the United States. But literally growing up, you would have said to, to some of the school classmates, the Chinese girl. And they'd be like, the Chinese girl? Lily. And so my brother was the, the Chinese boy. And so it's very different. And at that time period, it was also the Vietnam War. And so we've talked about a little bit about the judgment that people have on Asians being um, spies if you're involved in technology or other stuff. But also at that time period, for myself, it was very frustrating as a student to have no other issue than we're walking down the class and people assume right away that I'm Vietnamese or that I'm coming here as an as a immigrant or a refugee or the, the judgments that are being ca cast. And so as a result, um, for myself as a kid, I've been stuffed in lockers, I've had my tires slashed, I've had my windows shot out with BB guns, not, not real bullets, thankfully, but still it's very traumatic to, to a child to wonder why am I being picked on or why I'm being judged. But I'm thankful for those experiences in some ways because now it allows me some greater empathy to understand why it's so important for me as a leader to speak out to ensure that all people in our community are feeling welcome. And that's one of the things that um, is a platform that I think I encourage all of you to embrace, and that's what we're talking about today. But a little bit about my journey and how I got involved. So as um, it was mentioned earlier, I was an intern, and in my high school in Pennsylvania, we had a program called Career Elective, and it was an opportunity where when you finish, um, before you go graduating, to go out and find an uh, internship in the area that you'd like to explore. And Sometimes you don't realize when you're taking these internships, and I ask that you think about that as a student too, the job that you get may not be the one that you think you, know, you wanted or you're seeking. So I uh, was in computer science club, and I thought I wanted to be in a job with programming or coding, but yet the job that I ended up in was in marketing. And um, at that time, they had me doing RFPs and filing, and when we said inbox, you know, unlike the one that you have on the computer, my inbox literally was one where you had to stuff things in the box and made photocopies. But it allowed me the opportunity to teach me how to deal with people, how to be able to be confident and to work with others. And I will tell you that you have an advantage as an intern and to make sure to take advantage of that because I think people find it refreshing to look at the youth. Most people are very excited to have the opportunity to work with the youth and are open and much more friendly. Sometimes as they get older, um, it becomes more jaded. But when you're a youth, th it's very welcoming. So I had an opportunity to work for the marketing department. But after that, I was thinking to myself, you know, that's not just it in terms of the experiences. I w wanted to continue that opportunity. And um, I was fortunate enough to be able to secure a job with them full time um, in terms of, you know, for the summer. And I was the only child that was there, or the intern that was there, that was not part of a either corporate tie or a, a parental tie of other sorts. But it gave me great hope in talking to other students to see what types of programs and opportunities are there. Um, there are internships, and I have to tell you, that, that helped me shape my decision later on as to what university to go to. I ended up um, choosing Drexel University, and then it's a co-op program. And the reason why I like co-op programs, <laughs> I saw someone cheer for that, is that unlike other universities where you're just studying, it's a five-year school, and three and a half years I was in school, but I had three half-year internships. And each one gave me a chance to decide, maybe this is some area that I'd like to explore. 
And one of my first internships was working for um, IBM 9X Business Centers. I, I want to talk about that a little bit today and why it's important to stand up. And I wish that at that time I had some advisors. Um, coming from being involved in the schools, as I mentioned earlier, I did not mention that um, by the time I graduated high school, I had actually had a semester of college completed, too. <laughs> It's, it's another long story. I'll tell you that some other time. But I had a semester of college completed when I came out of high school. And um, that allowed me to get paid a little bit better. But being new and young, you don't think about that. And so I had colleagues at that time who asked me, you know, um, what is your pay? And being young and naive, I actually told my classmates what my pay was. And so because of the experiences that I had, I was compensated differently. But what I found out was surprisingly is not only were they unhappy with that, but they specifically then focused on me as an Asian and trying to put, point out things. And it got to a point in the end where it was surprising to me to be uh, told that, you know, we thought you're Asian and we thought you're a nice conservative little Chinese girl and you'd be here early in the morning polishing paper clips. And I probably shared a little bit of where to stick the paper clips that ended up in me not returning to the job. But it, you know, at that time, I wish somebody had told me that there are certain things that are rights for a student, that you have to be treated with respect, that you can't have this type of discrimination, or how to handle this type of this incident. So I think those types of incidents, um, while there's good internships and there's bad internships, you learn from those. And you learn how important it is for someone to have someone at the table. Um, other internships, I was going to say, that I think that helped shape me is I worked in Asia um, for half a year in Taiwan. And I would encourage all of you, if you've never had a chance to study a foreign language, to take a chance to learn more about the cultures and heritages that you come from, as well as those that you'd like to work with. Um, that will never hurt you, I think, in terms of opportunities. And that's why I love the Poly program or other programs where they have opportunities to learn about other cultures and languages. And so I lived half a year in Taiwan. And back then, uh, for people who remember the transportation systems at that era, there was no jieying, which means that I was standing um, on a bus almost every day, going back and forth on work almost for four and a half hours. And so it taught me endurance. It taught me that when I first got there, how important it is to learn the language. And that um, at first I memorized bus numbers. And then I realized, oh, darn, sometimes I ended up on express routes. And so it's important to, to get involved. And then back then in Asia and Taiwan at that time, I was staying at my grandmother's house. And it's not like TV now where you have all kinds of live streaming or other choices. There were only three TV stations. And since my commute was so long, I thought, well, let me make some extra money. And one of the best ways to be involved in the community is I taught English at a university. And it, Again, this is a situation where you walk in, and much like other students, I think that when you get there and you've seen like classrooms where you have substitute teachers or other stuff, they're like, oh, this is a chance for us to see what kind of teacher they have. And I taught a speech class at adult school. And when I first got to the class, I was observing the teachers and how it's just, you know, you repeat one another, but in terms of the teacher will say something and the, the student says something back. But that's not how real life works. And I think that teaching students um, how to deal with the real dialogue and conversations is important. So I ended up taking a totally different approach. And that's what I'd ask for you to sometimes use your own skills to approach different um, lessons. And so for me, I took them out to karaoke. I took them out to order pizza. I took them out to real life lessons because I felt that that would make them better students. And so my students who were actually quite critical of me in the beginning and making fun of me, so that's how I got to learn Taiwanese, um, ended up being good friends in the end because of the fact that I was willing to stick it out and to think of different ways to approach it. And so I ask all of you that you also consider some of those opportunities. Um, finally, I was gonna share a little bit about how I got involved in politics in terms of my community. I never I, I know some of you may come out and want to study political science. That was not my background. I came out and I worked in industry for many years. I was a worldwide sales controller for a company that's now uh, gone, but it's 3Com Corporation. And 
I also worked um, running a trade association preventing counterfeiting. So working with FBI, Customs, and IRS on preventing counterfeiting and intellectual property protection. But as a parent, I got involved because of the fact that when I sent my child to school, there were issues with overcrowding. And some of you may see that in your schools and classrooms. But when I went to the meetings that I saw, and my school area is predominantly Asian, um, I saw a lot of parents and people who were upset. They were either crying or yelling. And I'm like, okay, we must have a more productive way because this committee had been meeting for two and a half years and nothing had happened. So I went and pulled all their uh, board policies and their administrative regulations and came back two weeks later and had a PowerPoint presentation. And um, when I presented it, it passed the committee. It was the first thing that I passed in two and a half years. But it went to the superintendent and it got rejected. And at that moment, I asked them, what's the next steps? And they're like, there is no next step. This is it. I disagreed. And so I started writing our school board trustees. And I was saying, well, look, this is your committee. And not much has happened in two and a half years. So if you want to see change, let's, you know, let's have a discussion. I want to be on the agenda item. And I had to write them for about four months before they'd even consider it. But I got to speak for five minutes, and during which they were on the dais, and they listened, and then they unanimously rejected it. Um, but th what surprised them is then the next day, for when school starts, a couple days later, I ended up on the front page of the local newspaper on the first day of school. So I told them that I wasn't going to go away, that I was going to continue working on this to understand the process. And in fact, I did enough research to find out that the people that were supposedly helping me were actually the ones who put it in place. So because of that, I was able to um, work on the process. And my daughter did get into the school, into the placement. But it, this is where it's, it's a challenge sometimes. I think a lot of times for Asian parents, or even all of you, it's easy to say that this issue is only important when it pertains to me, and that it's something that you want to handle for that day. But when you realize that, it's not just about you for that moment. It's about how can you address things ongoing, procedurally, or to ensure that a voice is being heard. That's where the change is. So when my daughter got in the school, I didn't just stop there. I got involved with the PTA and school site council. And when there was opportunities, then I stepped forward to be the PTA president. And I think that that was really important. Our school district is one of the ones that is probably best known for its quality of education. And there were some discussions about reboundary. And, and, and it's a very lively discussion because in my city, it's about 55, 60% Asian. And it was going through a period of great transformation. And past practice, or there had been a situation where they had pulled a school out and moved it to a different district. And at that time, I watched it as a community member. And sometimes the things that are being said were so hateful on both sides in terms of um, Asians not being as involved, and also in terms of their feeling that Asians want to secede from the school district. So when I took that opportunity as a PTA president, I wanted to bring people together. I wanted to unite people rather than divide them. And so we focused on things that everyone could relate to. And I think that that's important when you're trying to argue something with a group of people, is that you're not just saying, you know, this is what makes us stand out and why we should be separate but rather why we should be together. So I focused on areas about how we need to walk to school. And I had a group of parents, and these are the same parents that I work with today in the community. Because you want to have your peer groups and those who really care about what's going on as a community um, involved with you. Not just because sometimes I think that when I look at the, the politicians, and I myself is one of those included, it's easy to get caught up and just focused on what the political w engine wants you to look at. But it's important that you always keep in touch with the people. And so um, for all of you as interns, I hope this is a good opportunity for you to start in this area. Um, this is just a beginning of a journey for you. Um, I, I'm very excited when I look out on our youth. It is critical. And I tell you also that when you look out, you may not realize how, depending on what cities you live in, how much there is a lack of representation. I just got back from the National League of Cities and I'm fortunate enough to have been on their nomination committee last year. And for National League of Cities, it shows all the Asian municipal electeds. Um, and of those self-identified 
we make up about 2% of the National League of Cities membership. And that's important to note because if we didn't have people at the table, it, it doesn't allow us to have these conversations. And so I know that at times I rock the boat a little bit because I've asked questions. When I look at the presentations on housing or I was at the Harvard Institute of Politics and we're talking about data and voter data, they had data for Latinos, blacks, Native Americans, and white people, but no Asians. And I actually raised my hand and asked the professor, and he said, Asians aren't statistically significant. And I invited him to come to California to visit me instead. But, or, you know, it, it, I think it's important that we call those questions. I will say that I've been to the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and we talk about housing for Asians. I don't want to say the financial institution, but they had data on housing. And the first year, I asked the question, I go, how come there's no Asian data for homeowners or anything? And they said, well, Asians are hard to count. And I asked them if it was hard to count the six branches that's of their bank that sit in my city. But, you know, I think that the following year, surprisingly, they came back and they saw me in the audience and they were panicked because they were, I was seeing them rush around. They were trying to get data or something onto the chart because they knew that I would ask the question again. So sometimes it takes also persistency and coming back and that will to ask that question. So I'll close on the final note, and I'm hoping that it's gonna be something that'll be the change for the future. In my city, for 63 years, I'm privileged to be the first woman and the first minority mayor in our city's history. Um, <laughs> but, but I'm also surprised, just a few months ago, for um, women's, Leadership Heritage Month that I was surprised to learn from APAX when they had the data of or the people they were profiling. I was looking at it and I was like, that can't be correct. One of my friends sent me a picture. And in the US history so far for mayors that are for large cities that are directly elected, there have been four Asian women in the US history. One was uh, Mayor Saito of Long Beach, Mayor Jean Kwan of um, Oakland, and I guess I was the third person in the U.S. history, and then Mayor uh, Kuo of Bakersfield. But I would love to say that that's not the case. Right now, even the United States, believe it or not, for the large cities that are bigger than 100,000 people and for directly elected mayor, there are 10 women of color. And so I really hope that that changes. Part of it is programs like this, and that's why today, please take advantage of this opportunities for the students to consider roles and opportunities. You don't have to be a, a politician, but take a stand and to make your voice heard and to be part of the solution and not just the problem. And I also encourage the leaders that are here because you guys are already working with um, the students and in your communities. Don't just work on this program, but encourage others, your peers and yourself. You don't have to necessarily run for office. You can be involved in commissions. You can be involved in your community and other leadership roles, but to make a choice, and that's what I think um, Michael was talking about, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Chang was talking about earlier, is how important it is for you to make sure that we're heard. Because if we don't speak up, I think people do assume oftentimes that Asians are really quiet, Asians are really meek, they don't unite, and they don't work together. And that's where I think that that rhetoric is, is something that I'm very proud to be able to change. Not in a way that's just yelling or um, being negative, but in a way that's thoughtful. And then they recognize the strength and the power and your logic in the fact that you have organization. And that's what I see when I look at the Jewish organizations as well as the, the other ethnic-based groups, is that they've been able to work with each other for a long period of time, and that change is what you need to be part of in the future. So I look forward to hearing back for all of you in the future on what great things you've done. I've seen Evan Lowe since he was a student, and he was actually the MC at our, our events, at the, I think for the dinner. And in you, I'm sure there's gonna be some great leaders, and I can't wait to hear your stories. So congratulations, thank you for joining tonight. I'm looking forward to being part of your journeys and to help you where possible.